All right, welcome to the CES meeting. Uh, today, we will have a short update from Caridi on uh, Shadow Realm and then uh, have a discussion on import assertions. Uh, Caridi, there you go. Yeah, so there's a very quick one. So we have been talking about the global opt-in being a, an event target. Um, it, it seems that implementers are okay with, with that idea. Um, they also propose to be more based, based on existing or prior art on these. They propose that the global optics should have a prototype that is mutable, which is different from what there is today. Today, the, the window prototype and all the proto chain all the way to the event target is, is uh, non-mutable, uh, non-configurable. So, they are proposing that that um, should there was work. A, the, the reason it was made non-mutable was because of a, frankly, bizarre security concern, but it was a security concern. Um, uh, has that concern, security concern gone away? No, that I know of. I, I believe, so I believe the, the security concern is not a problem with Shadow Realm, but I might be wrong here. So you can provide more details. Maybe we can talk about it. But the the assumption that we have, or the requirement that we have for Shadow Realm, is that the global object can be used to virtualize environment, and therefore you cannot have any uh, unforgeable, including the proto chain. And as a result of that, it seems that they are okay with the global object to have a underscore underscore proto pointing to a, an object that uh, has these uh, event target uh, internal slots uh, and then whose underscore underscore proto is the event target prototype. That's the proposal. Okay, good. I think you're right. Let me let me recall what, what little I remember about what the security concern was. Um, it had to do with um, uh, starting a starting a, a you know a page or a frame uh, as and parsing HTML uh, and the whole browser type sniffing thing. Um, uh, I cannot remember the details of the exploit, but I think since shadow since a shadow realm is never. Is, is never even in a browser context created such that there is an uncontrolled parsing of HTML before anything ha happens with the set shadow realm. Um, it's not like creating an iframe. I but, think that, I think that the con the security concern does not apply to shadow realm. Uh, my understanding of the security issue was that because the window remains the same, uh, opt -in, oh, you, oh, the, the you changing the prototype, uh, the underscore that's called proto the window proxy, like you are able to change that. What happened when you navigate to a new page? Uh, oh, it's okay. Kind of it's not about navigating, it's about loading script. Well, n navigating might be part of it, but it's also about having script tags, and uh, which could be in the case of a worker from like import script. Uh, which you use as a way, or it could be through import. There could you could access this through dynamic import. This behavior, where you get some cross origin resource and you execute it, and by looking at the error, you can see uh, what that contained. So I think if we still allow import to bubble up to host import, uh, this issue applies. But I don't. I really. I I missed some context here. Why we're zooming in on this particular issue. Uh, what what is the semantics that we would adopt that that puts this at risk at all? Why wouldn't we just make an immutable prototype chain for the global object in the shadow realm case? Why we will not put it as immutable? You said. Yeah, yeah. Why wouldn't we just apply the same thing? Right. If if it is immutable, then you cannot virtualize that global object. You cannot. Yeah. So let's just do that. Uh, I would prefer. If we're not, if there's not actually a security concern, and since the whole uh, immutable global object thing was never a JavaScript 
oriented concern and we've always to deal with a browser problem. If Shadow Realms don't have the browser problem, I would prefer uh, not to impose this restriction. I don't see how they avoid this problem because the problem was all about importing scripts that were from another origin and being able to get some of the contents of that script by looking at the error thrown. Uh, because you would do the two things that aren't scripts. And so this would be a privilege escalation because you're not supposed to be able to uh, just do a fetch to another origin. That's a violation of the same origin policy. So how does this, how, do, how, how, how does this come? I mean, Shadow Realms are not parsing HTML. Shadow Realms, this is not about parsing HTML. The error, the, the security issue, and I know this because I like, championed making the prototype chain of the global optic immutable for this particular purpose so that I can ship proxies in uh, the the um, how does cross origin script execution arise if you're not parsing HTML through an import a dynamic import so you're doing inside the shadow realm you're saying because I'm doing a yeah. import yeah. with a string value that points to a cross origin, um, I'm fetching and executing something from another um, origin and because I have some uh, uh, mechanism in place that prevent me from that to happen, I will be able to catch an error. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so sometimes the other origin might be configured even with all the core stuff that HTML does correctly for fetching scripts, it was considered that sometimes another origin might leak information in like a random text file fetch and that you could address any kind of script thing to to, to that. Um, I think, oh wait, maybe this was unique to, oh, sorry. This was unique to script, backing up a lot. This is unique to script tags and not to, imports because uh, when you import a module, it checks the MIME type. And when you use a script run, it does not check the MIME type. Good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, but that's, but this is, uh, okay. That was the crux of it. Sorry oh. for my confusion. Okay, okay. Um, okay. So there were several different issues that about HTML integration, right? Uh, maybe we should go over like all of them while we're talking about this. Well, yeah, that, would be, that would be great because I'm completely unfamiliar with the HTML side of Shadow Realms. Like one of the issues was which things are we going to expose, and what is our rationale for that? Yeah, but that but maybe a step, maybe a step. So the first one is that we have any concerns about what they are proposing to do, which is a, a proto chain that is configurable um, and the intermediate object who is going to be the one that will have the two string um, uh, behavior to print out shadow realm global object if you try to make it to string. Right. And then that one will inherit from a event target prototype. Do we have any? Could any you link to the the place where this discussion is happening? Uh, yes, I can link it to it if I can find it. Walker is doing that. Dan, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding the conclusion of that previous discussion that it does have to do with parsing HTML and particular script tags because of the sniffing behavior. And that because uh, dynamic import only does modules, not scripts, uh, modules are, are not, are based on MIME types, not sniffed, not sniffing a content. So and therefore the concern does not arise. Is that the conclusion? Be clear, we're not talking about sniffing. That doesn't come into this. We're just oh. talking about not checking the MIME type. The, when you have a script tag, it doesn't decide what to do based on like reading some of the contents of the script. It just ignores the MIME type. That's I see. Like, I see. There are other things where sniffing comes into play. Okay. Uh, okay. And so, so, so in this case, it just comes down to 
Scripts ignore MIME types, modules don't, and imports can only import modules, not scripts, and therefore the security issue does not apply to Shadow Realm. Is that the conclusion? Uh, I think so, but I also like the idea of making the global object still immutable. Uh, let me let me catch up on this thread. Uh, uh, I don't. Thread. This is the one. So all the comments below is just saying that this is the way to go. But basically, the global object, which is the ordinary object today, whose uh, underscore the score protocol will point to shadow realm global scope prototype, um, whose own properties will be constructor and the two string type. And it will uh, point to underscore the score protocol to the event target prototype with all the things that we have today. And then uh, that we had it from, from the object of the time. So that's kind of the, 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 the reason. The reason why we need this intermediate one is because otherwise we'll have a, a, a global object that when you, to, you do to string on it it, 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 it will print out event target. So it's like this one. Uh... Yeah, you know, I think we should do the web platform usual pattern. Um, so I agree with the other people here. And we could define the, this with web IDL where we make an actual Shadow Realm global interface. And we say, just do the steps for, you know, initializing an instance of that interface. I was planning to to work with Daniel on that, but I didn't really have any time. Uh, free cycles to work on this uh, the last few weeks, and I don't expect I will have any on the next few weeks. So, any any objections, comments on this particular topic? Nope. Okay, perfect. Um, so, just that, so, 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 the conclusion is that. The prototype chain is mutable, which enables emulation of hosts that do not have that that have other natures of global object. Yeah, it means you can get rid of all the event target stuff if you want. Great. Yep. Uh, so Go ahead, Dan. good. Good. So that's one aspect. We were also does this mean that when you have an unhandled rejection happening within the shadow realm, then it gets triggers that shadow realms oh. unhandled rejection event? So what we I think the last discussion, and correct me if I'm wrong, Karidi, but the last part of the discussion was that unhandled rejection propagation is currently broken anyway, for example, between a uh, worker and um uh, and the main thread. Uh, and Shadow Realm is not going to try to fix it because there are uh, there are issues about the promise identity that uh, that are needed for uh, the uh, the handlers that we cannot propagate through the boundary right now. Uh, so we'll need to figure out a, a way to handle this uh, appropriately. Uh, sorry, when you say broken, you mean it doesn't propagate from one to the other? Correct. It doesn't propagate okay. currently. That doesn't sound broken to me. Uh, I think if we Shadow Realm being an event target means that it can have its own unhandled rejection handler and that the promises rejected from inside the Shadow Realm would go to that. And that seems like how we would want it to work. I was. Yes. Was that was that going to be possible, by the way? Uh... It wasn't going to be possible if it wasn't an event target, because right. then how did the error be reported to it? I mean, this also applies for exceptions unhandled exceptions thrown in the shadow realm? Yes. Those will work fine. That one will, those will work fine. And those will work fine propagate. with good semantics. But they, the, will, they, will, they will propagate. They so, propagate sorry. if they're not handled. If they're yeah. not handled, will it call window.onair on the shadow realm or will it call window.onair on the enclosing thing? It will first call, I, I believe it's going to be the same behavior as worker, which is it will first call the window uh, on air uh, in the shadow realm and if that doesn't handle it, it will propagate up to the parent realm 
or to the no 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 we said on the, the root, root route it doesn't go through a list it just goes back uh, immediately to the root route right okay that that sounds like great behavior is this written down anywhere and if there's an issue with that yes it's written down in that issue yeah uh it's been a few months so i'm a little bit okay details but um so this is your comment from november 29th where um i don't i don't see where the conclusion about this is written okay anyway if we agree on that then that sounds good yeah so i i have a comment on december 14. um that, those were the notes from the discussion here about that particular aspect of it but no conclusion on that one but that's So below your comment from that there, Dominic then suggests that there should be this intermediate prototype object, which is like the shadow realm type of thing prototype. And that makes sense to me. And that's where like things like structured clone would live. Uh, does that seem reasonable to you? Or, I mean, maybe not structured clone, but two string tag at least. The string tag, yes. The structure okay. clone, I'm, I'm, I would think about that. What, why do you think that that would be there? In oh, uh, because just because I um, got myself confused. Um, so, okay, great. I'm happy with this design. Then the last thing I think that Daniel mentioned is that we need to figure a better way to explain um, what should be added to the shadow realm and what should not be added to the shadow realm. And the main discussion between that and me has been about fetch, I believe. Uh, the example that Anna brought up wasn't about fetch, it was about uh, different event types with Anna kind of making the argument, either we should include all the events or none of them, but the event constructor itself doesn't do any IO. So the question was why in the current draft, it included some, but not others. And to clarify, we're talking about the graph of the HTML integration of Shadow Realm, yes. not the graph, not the ECMA graph. Yeah, the ECMA draft, everyone's happy with, I think. Okay, great, thanks. The last time that we discussed this here, and it was not here at that time, um, we, 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 our position was, we really don't care if it is there. Yeah, it, it should be. Uh, it should be mutable, and that's all we really care about. And if they want to add whatever they want to add, that's fine. But Daniel has some. Uh, I just think we have to come up with a concrete suggestion, and write down the logic around it. That's what they're asking us to do. And part of the discussion with Daniel was about prior discussions around IO and how we want to prevent IO from happening yeah. in the shadow realm. At some point, I think we dropped that ball and saying, well, Great. oh, it is. Yeah. And yeah, so I heard that last time you were discussing this, you were going to include fetch and all this stuff. And that sounds really broad in a way that I don't think anybody's asking for. I think uh, Anna, when I talked to him in the past, I can't remember if it was in a thread or not, uh, he seemed he seemed sympathetic with the idea that these things would not do IO and that that would be the organizing principle. And so we would include all the classes that don't do IO and exclude all the ones that do do IO. Um, and I think that's pretty easy to define and work out. The problem was that uh, what, what Leo had made before excluded a bunch of things that don't do IO and there was no clear organizing principle around it. Yeah, and the, um, at least part of the discussion that we have had in the past is that if you exclude those things, um, you should have a very strong reason for doing that because it will hinder the ability to use the shadow realm because it will not have fetch. And how do you do fetch if you don't have fetch? You, right. I, so that's what I was confused by because uh, it, because for fetch, I thought it would make sense to have a membrane around the fetch that the outer 
thing does. And that's how you would. Oh, it will work if you put a membrane, but you are putting a membrane. Well, I think you can't get very far with Shadow Realms without a membrane. That's the consequence of the, you know, strong boundary design we adopted. There, there was also one, one, one point that you made about fetch versus dynamic import. Uh, Remember the yeah, details there, I, but you were so, saying that they're not the same and we should not because one of the things that we mentioned in the past, at least that I remember, Mark, was that, well, there is IO already. If you're doing, you can do, yeah. fetch, I mean, you can do uh, import and you can interact with uh, some of the timers. Uh, you can do a bunch of other things. So, so where do you draw the line between what you can do and not? In, in general, I guess I'm not a big fan of that style of argument. Uh, like, oh, you know, it's a slippery slope anyway. I don't know. I think saying the only IO that you're doing is import and all other IO is prohibited is, is a clear thing. And timers are not the same as IO. Uh, I'm sorry, that, where, where, where do timers arise in this, in this uh, context? I already just mentioned it. Um, so of, of being included in Shadow Realms. So I think they don't. Sure, they're the, the kind of thing that you might mock differently, but but they're not side affecting the world in the same way. Uh, so how, timer, so just to be very clear, timers are included in the HTML integration of Shadow Realms or not included in the I think they're JavaScript included Shadow Realms. in the integration, in the HTML integration. Okay. And definitely not in the JavaScript by itself version. Okay. So, uh, I don't know. There was previous. There was previously kind of a coherent goal of we're not going to allow any IO except for import dynamic import. And dynamic import is a pretty restricted form of IO. Uh, even if it's not that restricted, it's, it's less powerful than exposing all of fetch. So I thought it made sense to draw that line. Um, and we didn't get pushback from browsers on that. They seem to they. I had the impression that they, that they thought that that was sensible. So I'm not sure why we would go reverse it now. If you think it's really important to have this convenience of using fetch in a case where you don't have a membrane, I would like to understand more about that usage pattern. Okay. I just I'm, I'll, 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 just, I'll, I'll just insert my two cents here, which is, uh, I'm surprised that everybody was okay omitting fetch, uh, but given that they were, I'm happier to go with the omission. Um, uh, I, I expected to be forced to, ac to accept fetch. So if we, if we can go forward omitting fetch, that's great. Uh, what is the benefit of omitting any IEO capabilities uh, since we can remove everything anyway? Uh, it's, I guess the idea is that this has the safe defaults, which is maybe the same extremely high level idea behind having the, the strong boundary in the first place, that then you build something to communicate over as opposed to needing to build the boundary with a bunch of work. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't remember really the conversation or the details of the conversation. But from what I remember, the conclusion at the time was that well, it's too late to try to close out the I/O. Uh, in the sense that you you will be able to do some I/O already. Yeah, um, and that was the conclusion at the time. Uh, and then obviously we know the downside of not having fetch. Uh, we know what that is. It was more about, well, it's fine because we'll, you will be able to remove it if you want to remove it. Okay. I, so I, buy, I, I buy both of Daniel's arguments here, um, both the rationale for why you should default to, om to omitting it and why membrane-based is a perfectly fine way to add it back in. It's pretty heavy. Call. I mean, I'm 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 thinking, for example, like a testing framework or something like that that I might want to use Shadow Realm. 
it's pretty heavy cost to have to come up with a membrane uh, to be able to add back IO capabilities like that. Um, so let's let's continue this thread. I'd really like to understand how people want to use Shadow Realm without a membrane. I mean, the more uh, detail so about how such a framework would work. Testing environments that replicates, like if you're in Node uh, and creating a testing environment that uh if you're in the browser and creating that same environment that simulates another environment that replicates it, like that, if that other environment has IO capabilities, most of the time you don't need to go through the, the callable boundary for, uh, for some of the things. You can just virtualize on top of the capabilities that were present in the shadow realm. Uh, a, testing, a, a testing environment might not need to go back and forth between, uh, uh, between the root realm and the, and the shadow realm. Um, wouldn't you want nodes IO capabilities to be exposed in a testing environment, which are different from the ones like are you are you expecting that the node built-ins will also be available? No, but you if you leave them in, if you leave the if you leave the hosts capabilities and you implement your IO capabilities that you're emulating on top of them hiding uh, the uh, the original one you don't need to go through the callable binary and you don't need a membrane what's the goal of using shadow realms in the first place for this use case Having a place where if you run your test and you you can go and and uh, nuke your your whole uh, all the intrinsics and then just kill it at the end like you know that that's why testing frameworks always create in your own. So it's basically like a lightweight process that's not going to interact with the JavaScript that launched it at all. Just interact with the rest of the world via I/O. Is that the usage scenario you're picturing? Yeah, and reporting results back through the callable boundary. So the only thing that needs to be reported back through the callable boundary is the, is the result test. Um, so yeah, so reporting testing results could be done in a way that's lighter weight than having a full memory. Mm -hmm. um, uh it's it's hard to picture this because i think a testing library would want to do more io than the web platform provides wouldn't it i'm what? like what if, if you're mocking if you're mocking the things that you're fetching or something like that sure you can you, you can do that but most most cases you just give access to getting getting the content uh directly like a lot of content i mean in general like it's just you can do many things that are self-contained inside the shadow realm and then share results or not necessarily test results but share data that is serializable across the callable boundary so all the operations are happening there like a plugin system where you to do calculations or whatever you're doing, you do it there, and then eventually the results will will be shared with the incubator realm. The results. So the other the other form of I/O that's um, even more universal than fetch, much more universal than fetch, is console. What has been said about console? Yeah, it's, in the in the current in the current implementation, when you look at uh, the, the Behind the flag in Safari, they, they don't have console. Um, but if you don't have console, then how do you implement console? Like it's not simple. It's not that simple. Mm -hmm. You need just to do console, you need to have a membrane. You just want to run some code there that does something and right. returns back the value. I'm more sympathetic to adding console than I am to fetch. Yeah, I, this is exactly the same conversation that we have in the past. We start from you have import, and then what about console? 
What about this other thing? What about this other thing? And say, yeah, sure. So <laughs> I why even bother to block that? Uh, it feels to me that we're not having the exact same conversation. That's fine, but uh, uh you know, I'm not the champion of this proposal. So it's up to you what to propose, but I just but it was it's clear that we developed this. I, my understanding was that we had developed this cross-browser consensus on this organizing principle that, in general, we were going to omit I.O. Maybe people were happy with that. If you want to have a new principle, then you'll need to state that principle and uh, have that discussion with the, with the browsers and get them to agree to it. Um, and that's totally doable, but it requires like expl explaining yourself about what the concrete proposal is rather than just saying we're okay with anything. Because you're, yeah, you're the one. I, to, I don't uh, think we, it, the, the I/O wasn't a stated uh, principle, but for sure we, we can we can uh, if we agree that we will allow any kind of I/O. Sure, we can we can do that. I mean, what whatever you want to state as the con conclusion, whether it's including fetch or excluding it, uh, both the principle and the listing of APIs are the kind of the deliverables needed. Okay, I'm I'm still prefer to see us exclude it, but I also um, you know uh, admit that uh, as long as you know since since it's since whichever way you default it, you can build the other one um, out of it, and the and it's and the issue is absent from the JavaScript standard anyway. Uh, I don't um, I don't have to to weigh in here in a strong way. Um, I do also, uh, does, the, does the web standards standardize console? Is console part of web standards? Yeah, it's there in what week? It is, okay. So, by the way, when you write an explanation to this group, it should remain free of the, the sort of technical language that's used in these discussions. Shouldn't use the word unforgeable, for example. Uh, because that's a statement of the goals of this group rather than the goals of, of them. I mean, just if you want to say like there shouldn't be any properties that are not deletable or something, uh, and that we're okay. I don't know. Just just to enable communication here. Um, right. Oh. Um. Great. Is there anything else on this topic, or should we switch to uh, the topic of in-for assertions? I just want to say that with that not being deletable and being unforgeable are distinct concepts. So the first requirement should be precision. Uh, yeah, the word unforgeable has been used in multiple ways by this group, I think. Um, so I agree that things have to be precise, but also terms like unforgeable just have to be not used. Unless what we're talking about is unforgeability that has nothing to do with undeletability. Um, a, fre a, a, fre a fresh you... symbol, a, a fresh anonymous symbol is unforgeable. Okay. It's a, uh, it's a fresh I'm identity. I'm with that, that being... concept, but there was a different concept used about things like window.top where right. some other piece of jargon was used to refer to the undeletability of that. Right, and the, and the reason not to use the term unforgeable for that is because unforgeable is the wrong term for that. It is not an unforgeable issue. It's not, the issue is not unforgeability. I believe this, the ECMAS spec says it has to be uh, configurable and the configuration has to succeed or something like that. Like, um, it's not like- uh, Okay, has to, that's great. Um, has, as long as to... as long as we stick to like describing the observable behavior as opposed to words that describe the goals, which then have to be like decoded and worked through, then yeah. I will it'll, it'll it'll work. I okay. think I asked. I, I don't know if it is now, but I, I think I had has to make sure about the success of the configuration because uh, if it's an exotic object, it can be like oh, claim it's configurable and then. It actually doesn't change if you try to uh, reconfigure it. Um, all right. Um, all right. Um, let's switch to import assertions. Um, 
who wants to drive this conversation? Mark, you had to put this on the calendar. Uh, I'm not the one who put it on. I'm just the one who keeps, you know, um, uh, postponing it until we have critical mass to discuss, which we finally have today. Um, but uh, yeah, um, uh, I can I can discuss it. It would be better if we had um, Nicolo here, but I've been participating in some of the discussions. So um, wait, let me write him to see if he's available to join. Um, Okay, well, I wrote him, but I can I can start explaining. So in the last meeting, we we discussed how it's not enough to have import assertions. We have to be able to uh, modify what the module does, or at least how it's fetched, which changes what it what it might be to meet HTML's requirements. So there are kind of three three questions from there about what the expressiveness of this should be. One question is, should we maintain the arbitrary key value nature of import uh, attributes, or should we limit it to just one key? And I think the, the champion group's opinion is we should maintain the multiple key aspect of it, the multiple attribute aspect of it. Um, another question is, uh, should... Um, What should happen when unsupported assertions or, or unsupported attributes are, are given? I mean, currently in import assertions, unsupported attributes throw. And so we're we're saying this still this makes even more sense for import attributes because uh, they could change the interpretation and you wouldn't want to kind of lose that interpretation change. <laughs> and then the question is, are they assertions? Like, should we use the assert syntax? And the proposal of the champion group is to switch to a syntax based on with instead of assert, where the, the idea is we would keep assert in as inline normative optional comma legacy, where we somehow start to define legacy uh, with the goal that if it's possible, maybe we could delete it in the future, but it's included there now. And to the extent that normative optional is like an all or nothing thing, this would be acceptable as kind of piecemeal omitted. So we would definitely not be asking Chrome or, or Node or anybody to unship uh, import assert, but we would encourage new things to use import with instead. Uh, so, so this is the proposal. Um, it would not, we would simply delete the paragraph that says that you can't interpret a uh, module based on the import assertions, based on the import attributes now. Instead, they're just part of the cache key. And with Romulo's refactor of, uh, with Romulo's refactor, it's not Romulo's, uh, Nicolo's refactor of uh, the way that modules work, there's a cache at the JavaScript level in addition to at the uh, host level. So that cache at the JavaScript level would be keyed by both the specifier and all the key value pairs for the attributes. So I guess that's where I was going to go for the question. I thought there were discussions about having some attributes being uh, not part of the cache key and having like basically uh, free fall for, uh, for extensions or things like that. Yeah, um, so uh, for that aspect, the uh, the attributes after the width would all be part of the cache key. However, other things like uh, deferred imports or uh, you know import module, like the the different kind of modes for importing something so that it wouldn't be executed, those would be not done through import attributes, but instead done through a keyword that comes at the beginning, right after the import keyword. And the reason for that is because those are not part of the cache key, but instead about how JavaScript runs the module. The other thing is that those affect the syntax of the module import statement. So they would be added as individual syntactic entities. Um, and those would all be defined in JavaScript. 
and that's how that's how import module or import source or import defer would work. Then for uh, extensions, like if you have a tool or a runtime environment that wants to define its own import attributes, you would be strongly encouraged to use a namespacing scheme, <coughs> which might look like uh, start with an underscore to indicate that it's kind of private and then uh, write the name of your kind of namespace. So it might be node and then capital, like in camel case, the name of the attribute. So you might do like, uh, um, and those would become part of the cache key as well. Yeah, but they would be rejected at runtime if they ever made it into a final program. I see. Uh, but they would be part of the logical cache key. So we would make this strong encouragement, just like people are encouraged to use data dash attributes for, for custom elements or things like that. For when using uh, import attributes, you would be strongly encouraged to choose a name that is not likely to be a future name based on it starting with an underscore and then starting with like the name of your project. But so that, that means these um, these source files will not be executable uh, without being uh, transformed. That's right. Yeah. So this is erring on the side of safety. And I know Justin was a big proponent of being able to support this use case. Uh, yeah. So, and that, that is something Justin is comfortable with. Yeah, Justin has been very much part of these discussions and even proposed this concrete naming convention. I would have imagined something more like, and um, more like with a colon or something like that. Are uh, import hooks able to um, to catch those, or how does? Yeah, like import hooks would definitely have to receive the all the key value pairs of the import attributes. Okay, so it's and we haven't yet created a concrete design for that. Right. So it's possible the source would be able to be evaluated. It's just that you need a runtime import hook that can uh, do the appropriate. Uh, yes, exactly. If, if you're using the module constructor, then yeah, you could you could emulate all this stuff. And there would be no particular difference in terms of the import hook about whether the name started with an underscore or not. That's purely a convention. Yeah. yeah. But we would have a promise going forward that all the built-in things would not start with an underscore. Just like HTML has the promise that it's not going to have any attributes with a dash in them. Okay. How does it sound to you? I don't have... It sounds fine, but I, I have not been involved enough in other conversations to know if I'm missing some piece of the argument. So uh, uh, it sounds reasonable. OK, that, thanks. Do any other people have thoughts on this? Or did I go too fast? Should we go into something in more detail? I, I want to explicitly solicit uh, Karidi's thoughts on this. I don't have a formal opinion on this, to be honest. I was on the on the arena meeting as well on the, the other group, and I don't have. But a in particular, uh, about how it interacts with the whole module loader system. At least the way I I think about this is I'm, I specifically about layer zero, like a, a module constructor, module source constructor. Um, if you're gonna get access to that object with a with a width, I I feel that we we'll have a lot of power that we can exercise there. Because I don't believe, or at, at this point, I don't believe that the browser will ever implement a, a bunch of different uh, formats. 
and it, it, it feels to me that the providing the, the user, the, the low level API, so users can do that kind of thing, especially bundlers and tooling that can rely on this behavior to provide information through the import statement to the loader that will rely on this information to do the proper resolution and the proper uh, creation of a, of a module instance based on this information in the module hook. I think that's very powerful. But every time that I talk about that, I didn't get much traction. Uh, so it, right, when you say powerful, do you mean that as a good thing or a bad thing? A good thing, a good thing. Okay, cool. I like, think- like, uh, I, I, I see implementers of bundlers and tools asking for the browsers to do that for them. Like, let's have that uh, new API that you're gonna specify what kind of things that we're gonna load and then they will do all the due diligence to get it ready for them. I don't think it's going to happen. I did ask on it directly, but uh, he was saying, yeah, there's the interest on that, but I, I, I don't buy that to be honest. I think if we do something that will not be, that will not provide the, 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 the powerful API for a loader to do all these things in user land, we'll probably make a mistake. But again, like not, not, yeah. not really much traction there. So uh, I agree that it's powerful. And I guess what the, the champion group is proposing that we add this power. So to the extent that you're saying we're not getting much traction, okay. Uh, yeah, it's not at stage three. I'll say I'm not getting more traction every time that I talk about. Maybe I'm just not articulating yeah. it well. But uh, so, for me, it's like the object comes in, the hook gets that object, decides what to do with it. And its primary uh, objective is to create a module instance in whatever shape or form that module instance needs to be created. And that module instance represents a CSS or represent some other format or represent a WASM module, whatever it is it's representing, we can talk about that, but it, it feels to me that relying on the user engine for all these is just not going to happen. Well, and we what about the bundlers as well? Okay. So what, what about the, the, the bundlers? Because we will initially wouldn't have uh, the module constructor. What about the goal of, of being able to emulate one host on another host? Is that uh, all well supported by uh, what we're saying here? Uh, I think this would this would permit those things. Okay. Um, in conjunction with the module constructor. So I think the the hesitation that we might hear from engines is around whether the module constructor should be supported. Uh, short of having the module constructor, any emulation or power would have to be done by the bundler, right? Okay. Well, if we don't have the module constructor, the bundlers cannot do much either. Well, the bundlers would just not use modules. They would just yeah, yeah. Well, they would use something else. Oh. They can they can do things. They just can't. Yeah, 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 just yeah, not modules. Yeah. Um, so that I think that's that's really a, a good point. Like if we don't have a module constructor, then they will continue to do what they do today. If we give them the module constructor, why even bother to implement all these other things well, that the browser? I, they can do it. And use a lot. I, I do want to be able to make the argument for import attributes in a way that's independent of the module constructor, because I think we don't have consensus in the committee on whether the module constructor should exist yet. And hesitation about the module constructor shouldn't be the same as hesitation about import attributes. They're just separate proposals, um, even if we want them both to happen. Yeah, you don't, you don't have that, and the only consumer of those attributes will be the, the user agent. Fine. Yeah, the user agent and tools. I think the tools part is, is important. Um, so about about the import hook, there's a thing where we would have to pass an object for all the key value pairs into the import hook. And uh, I guess this would get a fresh identity for each you know, import statement. And there was some idea at some point that this be tied into records and tuples that you would get a record there. But since we got uh, hesitant feedback from browsers on records and tuples, uh, I don't think we should necessarily count on that. And we should try to convince ourselves that we're okay with this being based on uh, 
is being based on um, an object with those keys. So and having a fresh identity. What are the actual values for those uh, things? Can, can it be like objects? And uh, like, you can't really have them. The thing, they can only be strings. The values can only be strings. Okay. Yeah, but if, if, if you, you, you're you not observing that identity user line. Well, you could, wrong. if you have the module constructor, you can observe that yeah, identity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we go back to the, the, the module constructor thing, conversation, like the, yeah. the identity. Yeah. Thing is only if you have a module constructor, you don't yeah, have exactly. that. So I'm just talking about uh, something that we would observe with the interaction of the module constructor and this proposed. Yeah, and I, I'll say that, sure, representable looks really good for that case, but um, in the ab absence of that, I, I feel that the the module hook, whoever is implementing a module hook should not rely on the identity of that object but the values associated to that object, the key, the key and the body pair. I see Justin Zen. You're muted, Justin. All right, so there are a few topics. One, bundlers are fully supported with this. Um, we can do everything essentially. Um, you also asked about emulation. Uh, the only thing that's not directly emulatable is um, the module um, attribute which gives you an uninstantiated module instead of an instantiated module. And that's because it's not a part of the attributes, it's a part of the import declaration itself. Um, on this topic of um, the, fuck, I lost my place. What were we just talking about? Module, constructor, and oh, identity. Uh, you would The attributes themselves are a single depth object. Um, all of the key values are primitives. Uh, the keys are all strings, the values are, are numbers i guess no they're strings they're only strings um so you just need a single depth deep equality matcher uh in order to check your cache key here yeah uh i think what you're saying is that identity is not super important that we can yeah, so as so long as we uh, make the identity well defined namely that each import statement gets its own object identity for the attributes yeah uh, or and it's kind of useless in the first place or we could say uh, that the uh, the keys are ordered uh, lexically, and then you can just JSON stringify the thing, and uh, that's your cache key. Yeah, that would work. That would that would aid the if you're storing this in a map as well, because you're guaranteed an order, and you know the cache key would be equivalent if you stringify it. That would be pretty convenient. Yeah, I guess we can decide whether or not the keys should be sorted when defining the import hook, right? When defining the module constructor. Right. If you don't have that, you don't need you don't need any of this. Yep. Okay. So do people have any concerns about this direction for import assertions or any, any further comments? Oh, right. Um, well, I guess we are at time. So good timing. We didn't overflow today. So uh, thanks, everyone.